Good afternoon. Welcome to this installment of our periodic Tuesday race talk series. Today, we are delighted to have with us Stanford colleague and alum and friend, Darren Dotson. Darren is a passionate advocate for social and economic justice. He has worked with impact investors, private equity funds, Fortune 100 companies, universities, and foundations, all through the lens of using investment management to address some of the world's most pressing social and environmental problems. A graduate of Stanford Business School, where he serves in the Dean's Management Board, and also an undergrad uh, degree recipient from Duke University, Darren has previously led the Special Equities Program uh, as a consultant to the board of the Calvert Funds, a $12 billion uh, pioneer in the impact investing field. Calvert maintains a portfolio of more than 40 funds on five con continents that includes more than 350 portfolio companies. Prior to Calvert, Darren served as a director of university and corporate partnership for the Idea Village, where he created a platform for engaging private equity firms, business schools, and Fortune 500 companies to invest many hours and many dollars into New Orleans entrepreneurs in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Darren's current role is as a founder and head of Illumin Capital, which we will hear more about. In the wake of all this happened in our nation over the past year, from the killing of George Floyd and the protests that resulted to the pandemic that's provided the context for all of our lives, Darren's work at the intersection of race, social justice, and investing could not be more timely or more necessary. We're delighted to have him with us. Darren, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Professor Banks. So let me start by saying if if I can call you Darren, you can call me Rick. So okay. we'll act like we're just having dinner. Uh, let's start out with just, just your, your background. Uh, I mentioned you're the head of the Lumen Capital. How did you get into the investment business? How did you find yourself in this space? So I, I actually started in the regulatory area of the business, um, uh, inspired by um, studying the civil rights movement, economics and public policy at Duke. I joined the Center for Responsible Lending and had an opportunity to work with 60 attorneys uh, uh, that did rigorous data-driven analysis of the subprime lending market, proving that Black and Latino homeowners in the largest purchase of their lives many times were overcharged relative to risk. Um, we did uh, overlaid GIS statistical mapping with loan uh, terms like prepayment penalties and stripping and flipping uh, processes that remove equity from homeowners. And actually we wrote laws that are on the books now that um, do things like say that you can't make a loan unless there's a net tangible benefit to the borrower. Um, as you'll see, and uh, for those of uh, in the audience that are in the subprime lending market, we also have accident liability now in which the major purchasers of home loans have to test for predatory lending terms and, of course, racial uh, uh, bias terms within the lending process, or else they can be held liable for treble damages within those loans. So that's part of my entry point um, into the investment management business. Um, the second inspiration um, after my time at the Center for Responsible Lending for entering the the investment management business was really understanding that underlying a lot of the challenges in New Orleans after Katrina was also the fact that um, many homes were built in African American communities that were fully and outright owned um, by, uh, by, by people within those communities that were used to create businesses, et cetera, were really um, uh, had, had, had flooded. Uh, in the lower ninth ward, et cetera. So when you overlaid the wealth creation, the largest engine of wealth creation in the country, um, home ownership of helping people move beyond poverty into the middle class, and you looked carefully at um, the role of the investment management business, it certainly had a role to play in the rebuilding process. And then the final inspiration was my time at Calvert, 
uh, where I, I went um, and, and managed the portfolio that you described as a consultant to the board of directors. I had a chance to look at all of these different um, investments around the world in this field of impact investing, looking at positive and social impact and market rate returns. And um, that inspired me to create Lumen Capital, uh, the fund that I now lead. Okay, so now let me ask you just to let's stick with the biography for, for a moment here. Where did business school fit in there? Was that after, uh, after Center for Responsible Lending, but before Katrina and before Illumin? Yes, so I, I uh, applied to Stanford Business School um, after three years at the Center for Responsible Lending. And part of my uh, interest in business school was the ability to really understand what was being taught to leaders. Because mm -hmm. from my perspective, the leaders of the biggest banks in the world were um, uh, you know, essentially um, stripping the wealth out of uh, low income, um, oftentimes black and Latino families uh, as I was uh, headed into business school. So how could we create a way to uh, teach future students um, how could we create a way to right this system and in this incredible wrong? And of course, the uh, business school students that created the products that would later create the fall off of the cliff of the subprime lending market, could, couldn't they uh, reimagine a more equitable, sustainable, um, and, and of course, diverse asset management business? It was the sort of thesis that I went into school with. Okay. And, and, and how do you, we have a lot of students in the audience, so I want to take a, a moment. I mean, you're, you're someone who, who's really, um, you know, has, has done extraordinarily well since Stanford. You clearly had a clear idea of what you wanted to do while you were at Stanford. What advice do you have for other graduate students, law students, business students, other graduate students, for how to get the most out of their Stanford experience? So this is um, something that I learned the hard way that I wish I knew uh, going in. And that is that um, having uh, an experimentation laboratory while you're in school to apply everything that you're learning to that intersects not only um, your, your intellectual kind of edges and pushing you intellectually, but also at the intersection of um, you know, intellectual rigor and purpose. And that's what New Orleans was for me. So I uh, had organized 70 of my classmates. I, I wrote letters to uh, alumni who ended up supporting uh, our efforts in New Orleans. I took 70 of my classmates down um, in what was rated the highest experience in business school uh, over any class or any other trip around the world. And the reason why that was, was we went down with our professors, we went down with the staff members, and we shared in this experience of applying our skill set in, in ways that matter. And a funny story about that is, uh, after I graduated, I'd bring down students um, from the medical school, the law school, and other schools to try their skills out during spring break and really hard entrepreneurial problems to help mm -hmm. people, uh, you know, get their lives and businesses back together. And, and we do about a thousand hour projects per team um, and mix in MBAs, law school students, medical school students, and uh, give an entrepreneur sort of a, a, a boost through very targeted um, advice from students. And one of the things that we learned in the first year was that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> so, so we brought down students uh, without preparing them about the history of race or class or culture in New Orleans and put them in the position to give advice to people who had lived their whole lives mm -hmm. working on their businesses. So we uh, uh, basically deconstructed that program, did an autopsy in the first year, uh, and rebuilt the program from the ground up. And we used um, the context around race and class and, and, um, and gender uh, within New Orleans as a precursor. And actually, you know, the, the, the overall impact of the program grew substantially after we were able to incorporate some of these things to, to, to help us listen better, to help us uh, apply our skills better, to help us really learn from people that had the answers inside of them um, but reduce our biases when we were interacting with communities such that we could harvest those ideas. It was fascinating to sit uh, one entrepreneur, Miss Norma's snow cone shop um, on, uh, uh, you know, just right there on one of the main corridors and, and um, 
in in New Orleans, and this is uh, you know Miss Norma had just come back after Katrina. The the streetcar from down Carrollton hadn't been restored yet and was off. That was the main cor uh, corridor for tourists to come up to this street, and you'd sit with Miss Norma, you know, after we learned to listen. And you'd say, Miss Norma, what, what's going on in your, your community and, and why do you think your customers aren't back? And she said, well, you know, I don't think they know that I'm open. And after all the analytics and things that we threw, really just putting an awning like Miss Norma knew was necessary and, and, and sort of reinforcing that idea, a pink polka dotted awning ended up increasing revenue by about double within the course of a year. Um, and helping the, the, the store to continue to grow and survive. And there are many stories like that, but that's just one um, that I wanted to share uh, in, in our joint work. Actually, Harvard, um, uh, Berkeley, uh, Kellogg School of Management, Chicago Booth, Cornell, all joined into the program, and we all competed to provide the best outcomes for entrepreneurs within that work. Wow, that's fabulous. So you started that as a GSB student, and then you continued it after graduation. That's right. And sort of, it, 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 it's not hard to fall in love with the city of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, and after I'd spent time with people um, and, and sort of fighting uh, with them to um, uh, rebuild their companies and businesses, you know, I had received so much from that community, there was no place I'd rather be. So I joined the team of a 12 person nonprofit uh, in New Orleans. Um, I partnered with an alum, uh, Jim Coulter, uh, who's a trustee of Stanford and the leader of TPG and his family personally, um, who has ties to New Orleans to bring, you know, these thousand leaders from um, not only uh, our respective schools within Stanford, but also Google, Cisco and Salesforce leaders. Um, and, and all of them had the same challenge. All of us need to be in community with people that are different in context of race, class, mm -hmm. culture, um, to be able to learn. And it, what we found, of course, like so many uh, find when they travel around the world, that the exchange is mutual. It makes us better business leaders, better CEOs, better um, general counsels, et cetera, if we have the ability to listen to people who are different and incorporate that into the way we think about building our respective firms. That's great. And, and is this program still going on now or has it changed form or, or what? Yeah, it's been about 12 years and it, it has changed form to be more locally focused. I think, um, uh, you know, the, the, the partners uh, have, were engaged. We renamed it in some iterations, the Culture Challenge after Jim Coulter and his family. And we select kind of like American Idol, the top uh, entrepreneurs in, in New Orleans with 400 people. My favorite part of it was uh, uh, within the TPG portfolio at the time was Harrods Hotel and Casino. And we took, uh, you know, we, we cordoned off an entire street um, that, um, that we were able to, through Jim's relationships, really get access to. And we had 30 entrepreneurs from all different types of sectors uh, pitching. And we had about 500 kids from all across uh, New Orleans um, that had trips worth $100. And they go and listen to the pitch. Um, and that, you know, teaching people to be angel investors when they're five, six years old and giving them that agency and imagination, you know, beyond simply what they're learning in school um, with reading, writing, and arithmetic, exposing them to the idea of being investors that early was part of the shift of the cultural shift to return um, that entrepreneurial innovation that's always been a part of New Orleans. So when we think about the creation of jazz and the fact that New Orleans hasn't captured the value of that you know, incredible contribution and creation, New Orleans food you know, eaten all over the world and, and known all over the world, how do you capture that value? And, and we believe we, we really capture it by educating kids at really early ages. That was a a partnership with uh, Google and, and Drew Brees as well that uh, led to that. Uh, right after Drew Brees had, uh, after Katrina won the Super Bowl as the MVP. So <laughs> I could remember some right. days after school when he would just show up at schools and the kids would come running out. But using that energy to help them redirect to building and owning companies, being investors, et cetera, was part of the uh, work that we did that was really inspiring. Wow. 
So no, that's fabulous. The um, so um, no, that's an inspirational story, and that's really a, a model we think of how to take what you learn in school and the skills you're developing and try to apply them in the world. And one of the morals of this story, I think, is that you don't need to wait until after you graduate to do that. Uh, mm. You can actually begin while you're a student, get outside the campus, and just kind of bridge the divides that might otherwise develop. So that, that's a good uh, story for people to hear. Uh, could you tell us now you are the uh, founder and the director, head of Illumin Capital. Could you tell us about Illumin Capital and how you happened to found it? Sure. Um... After the eight years at Calvert, I would um, talk around the world and whether I was talking, uh, invited to speak around the world. So whether I was talking in, um, in areas of China or areas of um, Africa, um, in the UK, Brazil, et cetera, I would see in the impact investing community, which was my focus in the market return oriented part of that, I would see almost all white men in every uh, country that I visited that were leading these firms. And part of what uh, I began to, you know, it was ask is uh, why is that? Why is this field that is creating transformative uh, and reimagining um, finance so it's mo more beneficial to our world uh, so imbalanced in terms of what we would expect in terms of being led by women and people of color. When I began to look into the research around that, it, it, it helped uh, even more to open my eyes that 1.3% of $69 trillion in capital was managed by women and people of color led funds and asset management firms. And, and boy, was that below what we would expect to see based on the talent present in the United States or other parts of the world. So I began asking questions about that, challenging audiences around that. And a lot of the uh, counter challengers were, uh, well, if you believe in this so much, why don't you create a way to change it? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, I left uh, you know, uh, with the blessings of Calvert, actually um, the founder of Calvert invested in, and also joined our um, investment committee uh, who's one of the most experienced people in the world in this area, one of the first funds to not invest in apartheid South Africa in the early 80s and late 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, began to look seriously at this problem, which began with uh, really three specific um, interventions um, and strategies or parts of the stool that make up Illumin Capital. Number one, is selecting the top performing impact funds in the world, which to us also includes women and people of color re relative to their representation, um, which is about uh, upwards of half of our portfolio is women and people of color uh, led funds. Um, two is, you know, all of the funds go through uh, in partnership with uh, Stanford Spark led by Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, um, uh, you know, a strategy that's focused on reducing bias um, in those underlying investments in an evidence-based way. So that's an incredibly important um, strategy and I have the pleasure of working with uh, Rick's wife in that, in that incredible work, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. And then finally, the, the final leg of the stool is that we know um, from research that these challenges um, are not are, are deeply seated. So part of the, the learning from New Orleans is adopted within what we call the impact experience. And we bring our investors uh, so that they can learn about these critical biases as well as our fund managers into uh, communities like New Orleans or uh, Montgomery, Alabama to understand the connections between lynching, slavery, uh, mass incarceration and the roles that those systems played in creating the imbalance in the asset management business. Because many of us can't change a, a system that we don't know how it was created. So it does some really deep work. Um, everybody leaves with commitments. These are three days ex experiences that help to transform the way uh, folks think. You can think of this as like the dojo of uh, of learning about bias reduction. If you read a book about Bruce Lee, um, good luck fighting. 
Uh, <laughs> if you go in the dojo for a hundred or 300 hours with them, then you know, I think you, the success rate would be much better. So you can think of this as uh, on the impact experience side is really the, the how to apply these things. Okay, and how, so just to, to be clear on how the business works. So you raise money from investors and then you in turn invest in entrepreneurs who are who have businesses that both produce a financial return and also a positive social impact. Is that the, is that the model? That's right, with a slight tweak. Um, so we raise money from investors. We've raised $88 million and closed our fund one already. Uh, we've invested in 10 funds. So we are a fund of funds. Yeah. We invest in the sectors of private equity, venture and growth. Mm -hmm. um, and we re work with our managers to partner on a 10 year journey to reduce their biases. And uh, particularly as it relates to race and gender to increase their ability to unlock returns. And, and to your point, Rick, um, we all of the companies that we invest into uh, that underlie the managers that we invest into fall into one of uh, four different themes. Either they're transformative enable, environmental enabled companies that are taking on the biggest challenges in the world related to the environment. They're uh, financial inclusion oriented companies using FinTech to attack the, the same challenges that I saw in the, the subprime lending market. Um, or their ed tech companies that are looking at, you know, as everyone's trying to educate their kids at home right now, um, one of the things we have to be super sensitive to is the biases that are either eroding the self-esteem of uh, young people as they're transitioning online through the images, if they aren't filtered in some way of the challenges of the last nine months uh, alone um, could erode self-esteem, or if those stories are told in empowering in powerful ways, it can increase self-esteem. And you may know, and uh, the data that has shocked me over the last several weeks is that we are now uh, within the high school level of um, black uh, girls and boys that are at the high school level at one of the highest suicide rates in the last 10 years at 134% increase while all other groups are decreasing. And my, uh, uh, you know, in, in our conversations with our ed tech funds that are leaders in investing in this area around the world, we wanna make sure that we're creating uh, strategies to reduce bias. Um, so that we can help take some of the, uh, the pain out of that system. And finally, um, the area that uh, is so close to many of us right now that we invest into the leading funds around is health tech. Um, and we see the greatest, uh, some of the greatest disparities within the ways that patient treatment is happening and the access to um, you know, affordable healthcare. And that's a huge innovation curve. Massive companies can be created by um, addressing that frontier. And that's one of the things that we focus on as a fund as well. Okay, and do, do you make any direct investments in companies or is it all through funds that in turn invest in companies? It's all through funds. All through funds, okay. And how do you, you um, Let's stick with the, the demographics for a minute. Um, you know, you'd noted that uh, it was a shocking statistic. You said 1.3% of funds of money out in the world is, in, is managed by women or people of color, uh, which is to say that 98.7% is, is managed uh, primarily by white men, um, which is extraordinary homogeneity in the investment management world. Uh, how do you explain that, those shocking statistics? What, what are the, the elements of, of how we reach that or the, the contributors to how we reach that state of affairs? Yeah, my sense is that, um, you know, as a student of the civil rights movement at Duke, one of the things that blew me away was uh, the, the lack of, it, it was almost like the asset management business was behind a smoke screen. Um, and while we were, there were big gains that were made in, in education and big gains that were made within civil services, it's almost like a, a, a the backdrop of this 1%, 1.3% uh, of $69 trillion was really something that was incredibly challenged or, or not seen. Uh, it sort of 
prep beneath the service. And then when people began to figure it out, you can see 40 years of work of investing in uh, firms that are led by uh, women and people of color only getting us up to the 1.3%. When you think about the gains that have been made since Martin Luther King was assassinated more than 52 years ago, it's really a dismal number. Um, and there's not a good explanation that I've heard for why that uh, number has stayed that way. The NAIC, the National Association of Investment Companies, has studied the outperformance of black firms for the last 40 years. And what's, what's ironic is that even though there's outperformance, there's not an increase in the allocations to these firms, as we'd expect if there weren't challenges, which gets us to our research uh, with the Spark team. So we went out and looked at 180 asset allocators and we dug in, um, systematically tested them and A-B tested them uh, at high and low quality conditions. And we found something shocking, which is as you increase the performance of the funds, the bias also increased. So that is one of the explaining factors for why capital is not moving. If people are outperforming and they are perceived as a threat um, or, um, or for whatever reason they weren't invested in at greater rates, we have a real challenge. What we saw was asset allocators in that 180 would automatically imagine that black managers would underperform um, without any other information other than race on executing their strategy or raising capital or any number of other variables that we looked at um, when only uh, changing the race in a randomized way within the experiment. So it was a shocking finding, but it helps to explain something uh, to those asset allocators. And also importantly, it helps to explain something to those managers that have been outperforming and crushing it systematically for multiple years, but still are, are being overlooked. So part of what we do as a, a firm at Illumin Capital and our, our joint work with Impact Experience and Spark is hold a mirror to the global financial markets to really challenge the idea that uh, of fiduciary duty, because it's very hard to do fiduciary duty without working on your biases um, and the biases that are held by the organizations and institutions. And when we go to look at our investments and we work with our managers, we don't just look at bias generally, like most of the bias field uh, focuses on. We look very specifically at the key areas of resource allocation within firms. So. Um, many of us know uh, and are familiar with Daniel Kahneman's work in Thinking Fast and Slow, um, who helps us understand that bias reduction strategies that are general do not work. Focus on the 20% that creates 80% of the shift and in influence within investment decision making processes. He published a, a thousand company study with McKinsey that showed uh, increased ROI on investments of up to 7%. Uh, based on reducing bias. And part of what we borrow from that is a specific and focused concentration on choosing the best board members, which includes women and people of color to us that are over automatically overlooked and underestimated within the board selection practice, looking at the investment practice, choosing those that are automatically overlooked in that process. And then finally, the hiring, retention, promotion, and attraction of talent practices within the firm. So those are the three areas and dials that we believe the resource allocations and the attention of the incredible uh, leadership of Spark and in combination with our team of practitioners at Illumin Capital can really uh, focus on and unlock within, uh, with partners, within the partnership with our underlying fund managers. That's fascinating. Now, and how, I mean, and that is a striking finding. Part of the finding was that the more qualified investment managers are uh, when they're minority, the more likely they are to be subject to discrimination. Yeah, it's as if the system um, it has a, any, uh, some kind of uh, virus protection right. for um, keeping it 98.7% white male. Mm -hmm even though uh, the investment business, and of course what we learned in business school and, and law school around fiduciary duty is select, you know, we're, we're looking to select uh, the most competitive returns. That, that law is thrown out of the window when we're looking at the um, unconscious, often unconscious decision-making process of, of asset allocators. And it's so deep that they didn't even know that this is what they were doing. And, and in the study, we 
had a cover story, essentially trying to reveal the true biases um, of the underlying uh, asset allocators. And we had them compete against an AI, an imagined AI uh, selection process to really get a sense of their competitive and, and try to get a pure sense of that they weren't sandbagging for race or other things. And as soon as that um, kind of uh, competitive instinct to win came out, they made decisions that, uh, you know, Robert Schiller and his Nobel Prize winning research on narrative e economics, he said, you know, it, it, what's amazing is people in their own domain, in their own expertise exhibit these biases um, at um, extraordinary rates. And, and I guess the, the, the paper probably would be um, a, a marginal paper if it weren't for the fact that, as, as both Schiller and Kahneman said, um, you know, it's one thing if we face discrimination in a given meeting, um, uh, you know, within our, our, our life, if we pitch somebody and they say, we're not going to invest because we're black. It's another thing if every person we pitch has the same answer and the reasons they're giving are not empirically true. So that's what we're seeing more broadly within the field right now is that in every instance, what we call systematic bias, mm -hmm. uh, we can actually build interventions to overcome systematic bias. So that's the uh, key differentiator um, and proof point that is accelerated through um, you know, the incredible work of, of, of Dr. Eberhardt, Dr. Monk, and others that were authors on the paper, Dr. Marcus, and, um, and many of our team members. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the interventions in a moment. But first, how did uh, uh, officials or, or um, you know, leaders in the investment management world respond to this research? What did they say when you presented these findings to them? Well, it, the Pension Investment Magazine's editorial board came out in support of the research and said the field has to change. Um, there was a follow-up commentary that Dr. Eberhardt and I published um, that went, dove into fiduciary duty specifically, saying that if this is the claim um, and this is the test, then this is not what's happening unless people are getting bias. Uh, reduction training of some sort, um, because what we saw is the brain was systematically choosing um, investments or, or discounting investments, sorting them out, not because of their performance, but because of the race of the manager, which is, uh, you know, a challenge for those of us that love economic optimality and, and you know, outsized performance and returns. So the investment field, I think, you know, the papers hit about a million five hits, uh, you know, around, around the world. Um, I know that the, the CFA Institute has shared it with their 160,000 uh, members, and I just joined a future of finance committee for the CFA Institute. Um, so I'd say it's been well received. Of course, we have challenges to the paper, you know, and, and, and some good intellectual debates. Dr. Eberhardt and I were recently presenting to the um, CII, the Council on Institutional Investors that manages $35 trillion in capital, and we had you know, a wonderful and receptive audience uh, there. But, but as James, James Baldwin said it beautifully, it's very hard to agree uh, with what you say when I see what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so the true test of whether the paper is received is if uh, massive amounts of capital go to where uh, the optimality has been historically within the space. And find their ways um, to, to sort of right this huge imbalance within the global financial markets. Right. And, and what are the um, interventions, the, the key interventions that can work to redress this uh, sort of bias? You know, I, I think that um, it, it, Lumen Capital has some of those interventions and, and we focus on the, the, the three aspects of the firms that we invest into, um, the hiring and promotion mm -hmm. uh, engine of the firm, the board selection engine of the firm, and the investment selection engine of the firm. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll sort of move into the hiring and promotion. Many folks are familiar with the Greg and Jamal uh, study, Greg, Emily, and Jamal that shows same resume gets 30% fewer callbacks uh, if it's a female sounding name like Emily. 
and 50% fewer callbacks if it's a black sounding name like Jamal. And that's before anybody meets anybody. And we know that investment is an iterative process. Uh, there are often multiple interviews. And uh, what we see is, uh, you know, different um, barriers that come up at each of those different phases. I guess I, I, I use that to make the point that although that data has been around for a long time and people kind of focus on hiring, that when we take that same data and we flip the question asked within the research and we say, what if Jamal was 50% better than Greg? Mm -hmm. Then they get the, the average amount of callbacks, <laughs> the, the same amount of callbacks as Greg. If Emily was 30% better, it's the same amount of callbacks, which in investment, um, you know, higher, which in investments is arbitrage, right? There's a huge amount of value left systematically on the table for no reason other than people's inability to see it. So if you can figure that out, then you can find ways to select the best people. Now, when we apply that to investing, um, you know, hiring somebody could be 200 or 300,000. So you're missing a lot of uh, value there. But when you're talking about five to $15 million decisions on investments or even larger, um, you magnify the, the, the effect of suboptimal um, selection. So part of what we uh, look at um, you know, very seriously is the investment decision-making process um, and the board selection process. So those are, those are three wheels that we focus on in a firm. But what we also realize is much like the civil rights movement um, you know, in, in other movements, you know, before us, that these things cannot be solved uh, by, by uh, just woman, women and people of color. Um, it requires a movement of allies um, that are fighting together with uh, us, I will say, um, just like the civil rights movement. I was just reading Bob Moses's uh, work and one of my favorite professors uh, at, at Duke was Charles Payne who wrote this book, I've Got the Light of Freedom. And Bob Moses was talking about the fact that during the Freedom Rides, um, uh, you know, the, the, the landmark moment in which Goodman, Shorter, and Cheney were killed together, both Black and white people in the history of Black people uh, and no media attention happening before that being killed for the, the, the previous 30 years, and lists out many of those that were lynched um, of those uh, 10,000 that um, Brian Stevenson does just such a good job of documenting, you know, within the lynching memorial. So as we, as we really kind of look at the ways that these challenges occur, we, we realize that this is about working together and building a movement. So we have a cohort of fund managers of different races, majority uh, black and female led, um, but um, collectively um, we have a, a, a challenge of, of sort of getting our entire system to see the unseen, those that have been unseen for so long. And I think can, together we can raise that issue, but it will take an entire field and a movement to really change this. Wow. So do you think the black and female fund managers, do they systematically make different types of investment decisions than the white male fund managers? You know, I, I it, so much of this roots itself in psychology, but I would say if I if I had to guess, and uh, you know, uh, spending time with uh, uh, social scientists, will we, we, I, I'm not allowed to guess. <laughs> but if I were to guess, <laughs> um, what I what I would say is yes. And part of what uh, one example of why I think that way. I was just rereading um, Madam C.J. Walker's biography, the first woman millionaire in the United States who is a black woman. Uh, when you look at the business model of which she tried to raise capital uh, from white men around, um, one of the, the things that uh, kept her investor group mostly black and female is because they understood the relational model, business model that is steeped in black communities and culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we see, this is in um, Ed Nichols uh, research, um, also well-documented within post-traumatic slavery syndrome is the ways in which uh, communities of color and particularly black communities um, can accelerate models that later became things like the Tupperware model. Um, which is rapid uh, relational based sales that led to 
um, circles that would buy both cosmetic and hair care products that were built from a, a methodology that would just be very hard for a black man, for a white man to understand at that time, which was the strengthening of hair and particularly natural hair um, through products that um, that honored uh, the beauty of black women. And so that was the process that Madam C.J. Walker went through. So I do think there are some specific investment models and business models that black women um, uh, can see uh, because of their lived experience that opens an entire portal into a, a new area. That's one of the reasons um, that I think Unilever, I've been on the board of Ben and Jerry's for uh, the last eight years, and you saw Unilever acqu acquired Sundial, um, Sundial for uh, the Shea Butter Company uh, as a part of its portfolio. I don't know any of the details of that, but I think it's a powerful um, uh, addition to the overall portfolio at Unilever for that um, specifically because they're reaching an entirely new market that was a market that was built by both Black men and women that knew the underlying attributes of shea butter, a traditionally African, um, you know, all, all around healing and beauty uh, product. Wow. Yeah, no, I know shit. We, we know shea butter well. Uh, many people won't, but we, uh, and we've actually been part of uh, what you might call relational marketing of shea butter. So uh, that, that is close to home. Uh, let me ask you though, on, on, the, on the race front, do you, um, so you've done the research uh, along with, with Spark, uh, you publicized the research, you tried to make people aware of the problems. Do you see signs of progress now or is it, is it too early to ask that question? Hmm. You know, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I kind of hear the resounding words of Martin Luther King, uh, this being a week after his, uh, you know, this the, the celebration and recommitment to his work, um, uh, and, and you know how long, not long, mm -hmm. is you know, from my perspective, the time to get optimal investments is always now, and the time for justice, uh, gender and racial justice is always now. Um, and if you can marry those two together, um, then you have a scalable, uh, intentional, um, specific way of building and, and blasting through the wall of one of the last vestiges of the, um, the slave system, um, the system that destroyed the ownership um, of people and the separation of people from, from you know, the, the assets that they could um, used to send their kids to college or create a business or um, even get a PPP loan. <laughs> you know, th these are these are the the vestiges. These are the ways that lynching has metastasized within the system um, in order to prevent uh, the the and, and keep people from realizing their full um, participation and prosperity in the American and global system. So I think that one of the things that is ironic about this is that um, even as a student of this area, it took me almost uh, 20 years just to understand how imbalanced the asset management business is. And most activists that are fighting for economic justice within communities around the country have no idea that if they're working for a, a city um, as a uh, potentially a, a sanitation worker, that their uh, pension fund has been managed by 98.7% on average white men. Uh, my grandmother who integrated the schools in Washington, DC, I think she'd be shocked to know that as she integrated the schools, the, uh, the limitations on her retirement being managed by people that cared, that, that had the same um, uh, priorities around uh, women and people of color, or even had an opportunity to invest some of those resources um, to help move uh, the fields of uh, inequity on, on income and other types of um, inequities that sort of plague the country right now, I think she'd be shocked. Um, so getting this information out is one of the most important things that we can do uh, for those teachers and principals and others throughout the country that really don't know um, who's managing their money and, and how that money is being managed suboptimally until we ask some of these really hard questions about 
uh, racial and gender equity as it relates to our performance in the asset management business. Right, and, and am I um, right to connect your work to some of the, the recent conversation, which is a new conversation where people seem very open to the idea that part of the racial justice struggle has to focus on issues of wealth, wealth disparities across groups, access to resources. Not simply rights, but resources. Is that in the in the promotion of black businesses and so forth? Your work is a part of that conversation, is it not? It is, and part of the reason why I I, I sort of go back to Charles Payne's work is, uh, and this is I've got the light of freedom. You know, black business leaders were targeted and killed um, for four or five decades um, once, you know, the post-slavery. Um, and, you know, we're celebrating a hundred years or commemorating a hundred years since Tulsa uh, and the burning down of Black Wall Street. So if we don't have a financial analysis to equity um, and inclusion and diversity agendas, um, then, then things like a, a couple billion dollars sound good to us when a corporation commits to that after uh, you know, systematic uh, um, kind of racial terror for three decades and the systematic killing. What happens to kids when their parents are killed for outperforming and building like uh, Josephine McCall, one of uh, you know, her father, Elmore Bowling, built a successful trucking company and was targeted because um, you know, he might one day break the cycle of black poverty within Lawson County, Alabama. Um, and that's threatening to the power structure that wants to maintain dominance. So as we apply some of those principles from the 50s over to the current day in the asset management business, um, you know, what, what are the, the, the barriers and, and who is being, um, you know, systematically pushed back uh, without intervention around this bias reduction? Uh, you know, within these various systems. And, uh, you know, I'll, uh, one of my mentors, um, the, one of the leaders of the board of Ben and Jerry's, Jennifer Henderson, she often says, what, what, did, what did people do in Alabama? What did white people say? When, and she has a wonderful interview, and I, I don't know the exact source. What did they say um, after they, you know, after segregation, desegregation happened, and they were asked about the black and white only signs that were in front of the bathrooms. Weren't they glad that they had come down? And when they were interviewing a number of uh, the white leadership in the city, they said, what signs? <laughs> you know, because, because this is so rooted in culture, the extraction ability of those that are investing or those that are a part of a dominant system, one of the most, uh, the mass, the, the most powerful um, kind of realization of Charles Lynch, Lynch's, uh, you know, work around lynching was the idea that in the mind of the slave, they would automatically limit themselves or in Jim Crow South, they would automatically limit themselves and that the authorizing white supremacist culture, which would auto automatically authorize itself to not see these things. So we're working together to make the, this, the unseen scene in this process and sort of unlock um, the humanity of people that are systematically overlooked and of course the returns that they bring to the marketplace and represent through awesome performing firms that if we can find of course you know will we'll help to move the financial um, goals of our investors forward. Yeah that's fabulous so and how, and how does gender fit in here we've mostly talked about race how about bias with respect to, to women uh, in investment management? What have you found there? Well, I think a lot more work needs to be done, but not so much that we don't know that the intersection of gender and race is one of the terrific uh, you know, challenges and has dual um, uh, kind of impact on the ability for people to not see. Um, a lot of the uh, targeting of racial terror um, and lynching was, uh, in, in, in even, you know, with uh, President Jordan's work around eugenics, uh, when we look at um, Simmons and the gynecological work that experiments done on black women historically in order to pave the way for the pap smear and, and many other medical innovations at the expense of uh, black women um, and slaves specifically. 
Um, I think that there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, an even greater need to focus on women of color and black women in the investment industry and the historic outperformance that many of those firms have achieved. And um, we take that you know, super seriously at Illumin Capital. We want to build more research around that. But based on everything that I've seen um, so far in Charles Payne's chapter nine, is all about the women in the civil rights movement that no one's written about. Um, of course, we you know pay tribute to folks like Ella Baker, Miss Miss Baker, um, and um, and so many others that helped to be uh, without which the civil rights movement would not happen. I mean, entire chapters develop, devoted to women within uh, churches who were doing the work for the mass meetings and helping us to get to this point. So it's a, it, absolutely um, critical um, to focus on women of couple, color and the double um, intersection and challenge that they face. Um, and, and, and indeed, you know, women throughout the markets face, uh, you know, more broadly, but particularly women of color. Right. Okay, that's very, very good. So part of your, your focus is to invest in funds that will not only produce a financial return, but will also produce what we might think of as a social return. Uh, so you are you're an impact investor. Could you say a bit about impact investing and what's the relation between impact investing and social return on one hand and financial return on the other? Is there a trade-off there or not? Well, I, I, I do think there is an increasing trade-off that if a firm is not focused on impact investing, they may lose a lot of clients. Okay. And they may lose significant returns. So I would say it almost flips the other way. Mm -hmm. um, part of the power of you know Apollo, TPG, other major uh, mainstream private equity funds launching impact funds um, has to do with the underlying opportunity set is growing massively, uh, which is why Illumin Capital has been focused on it. And Calvert kind of ro rode that curve uh, since the early '80s in establishing. Uh, the, the field, um, which um, some would say is about $7 trillion in size across all, all uh, asset classes. But what we see, uh, you know, as one of the differentiators for the field of impact investing is that many people like those that are listening to this call right now may decide like I did, um, why would I invest and not create positive impact in the world. I mean, it just doesn't make sense, right? Why not, why not sign up to show up every day and unlock, um, you know, kind of uh, as a team, you know, our, our, our purpose and goals for increasing equity in the world, increasing, you know, solving these challenges around environment. Why would I do something differently? And, and I think if many of the people on, uh, you know, within our session, many of the people uh, within business schools, uh, continue to select firms that are doing both, mm -hmm. and because it's one is a more interesting problem to solve too. I mean, it's a it's kind of an intellectually challenging and rigorous pro, uh, problem to solve, um, which is attracting the best talent in the world, and the best talent um, is positioned well to find many of the best investments in the world. So, in the uh, talent competitiveness of firms, whether we're talking about uh, bridge span within consulting or whether we're talking about, um, you know, some of the big announcements around around climate um, and inequity in almost every major fortune 100 and 500 firm, whereas 10 to 15 years ago, they were kind of uh, trigger shy around a lot of these issues of sustainability. Um, they're seeing that they won't get the most talented people in the world if they don't stand up uh, for the, some of these important aspects of creating a sustainable uh, a planet of hacking away at, at education um, and the deficiencies and not, you know, it's a problem for the federal government if we're not reaching all students equitably, um, like, uh, like our education system has legally signed up to do. Uh, and ed tech can, you know, in some ways either exacerbate or help to um, help, uh, you know, uh, reduce some of these challenges. But a lot of it is how we go about creating these solutions. And, and, and of course, that's the, the, where we dig in and try to make sure that bias isn't happening. One cool thing you know, that um, many people uh, have probably spent times in firms that 
uh, have machine learning and AI, which a number of our underlying portfolio companies use. And obviously the biases of human beings are used to create many of these algorithms. Um, they get repeated and scaled within technology. So um, we're particularly at a point where people, where students like those on this call are needed to get this stuff right in the near term or else we'll end up having to deconstruct a lot of these models and it probably, you know, within 10 years, I think it'll be too late, maybe even before that, before we get um, some of these input rights, building diverse teams that help to uh, augment um, some of these awesome technologies to make sure that they're informed by uh, people and experiences that don't automatically rinse and repeat bias. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, this has been a very, um... A very hopeful conversation. We have a little while left. This has been a very hopeful conversation. What What are some of the things that you're most worried about when you look out there and you you see the terrain, uh, not only in the investment world but but in our nation? Um, from where you sit, uh, what what keeps you up at night? <laughs> it's a, a a powerful question. I was asked that question by one of uh, I was pitching the other day. And somebody said, this presentation has been pretty good uh, and we're interested in investing, but what keeps you up at night? And the answer probably, it was uh, surprising. Um, so, you know, one of my heroes is Dr. King and Dr. King was assassinated, right? So um, I think that um, what, what keeps me up at night is George Floyd that had $20, a counterfeit $20 bill leading, leading to the financial instrument, right? And Dr. King was talking about the check that came back marked insufficient funds, a financial instrument of a process based and rooted in the constitution, but it was a financial instrument. Um, and the intersection between the systematic killing of uh, black men um, in the United States and other parts of the world um, that is uh, made possible through a financial system that, um, that, that hasn't reflected on its own biases and all of the different ripples that that creates within criminal justice or the lack of access to education or disparities around healthcare uh, not being examined and re-examined and, um, and, and, and you know, smart minds like those on this call working hard to, uh, you know, pick up the oars and, and help create a new system that um, can get some of these biases out. I have to worry about, you know, if I'm ever in front of a judge, you know, the, the jury bias, I have to worry about, you know, so those are the things actually, and, and you know, I live in Oakland and I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons I chose to work there is because of the work that Spark had done, uh, you know, with the, the officers in the community and the police department to help work on uh, reducing biases there. And in my home city of Washington, DC, I can tell you we have a lot of work to do uh, based on uh, my experience growing up. So the fact that the most powerful part of the legal system, as I was told growing up, is the police officer in front of you and he, they have your life in, in their hands. Um, and they're uh, and they're oftentimes, you know, subject to these very same biases, although they don't intend uh, to have them show up is something that I, I remain, um, you know, very focused on. But, but what I would say is that taking a step back, it's the financial system that pushes forward and enables a lot of, uh, you know, either policies or um, operations or procedures within many of these different structures. So without getting to the backbone of the financial system and seeing um, uh, you know, race, racial uh, diversity and gender diversity relative to population there, we end up reinforcing these biases at a systemic level. Okay, so, so it sounds like you would agree with the idea that we can't have racial justice unless we have economic justice. Are those two that tightly linked? I, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm you're preaching to the choir here, but this is yeah. a. I mean, this is a this 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 is a connection that that people even advocates for racial justice, you know, in the not too distant past, were not inclined to make. Right. There is a a faith that we sometimes have that if we, especially in a law school, that if we can, uh, you know, perfect the legal system and the rules for how things operate in a procedural sense. 
but that'll somehow naturally lead to things working out economically. Uh, but it sounds like you're saying now things are not going to work out economically unless we focus on the distribution of resources within that system uh, itself. That's right. And I, I think, you know, there's a real reflective question for those within the corporate uh, you know, world of, and there, there's some really great commitments that are out there um, of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that are um, for racial equity. They're, you know, flying out the door mm -hmm. over the last nine months. And, and, but what I study is cycles, right? I mean, this is not, it's not new that a black man was killed. Right. Uh, it's not new that corporations uh, responded to it. What, what, what would be new is the depth of analysis that led to the number um, that people are coming up with and the continuous and rigorous commitment to never stopping until uh, equity has been reached. Um, so, or, or even when equity has been reached, a lot of the systems you know, have this uh, reverse effect. So you know, uh, the Civil War and then Reconstruction. So, big gains made there in the Senate and House and politically, and then push back. Um, the NFL um, integrating in the early 1900s, the Great Depression hits, and then boom, you know, uh, Blacks are pushed out of the NFL because it's a good job. Mm -hmm. So what, what's really important is to study, what I found is really important. I was just looking at the correlation between lynching and the cotton price. Mm -hmm. um, and what you find is no lynchings happen, very few lynchings happen during harvest season when the economic value of the slave is you know working at that at that point or sharecropper at this time in the 1930s which is also well documented in, in charles Payne's book um and the the fact that um during uh the depression there was also a, a fall off and then as the economy increased so so part of what we're trying to do is kind of figure out in up cycles and down cycles how do we need to rethink about looking at these systems so that it's not just in one of the highest market uh, moments in the world that people are, uh, you know, giving one time, but the the hundreds of times throughout every cycle that are necessary to make things, um, you know, more more right and more optimal. Um, and the idea that many corporations are, have not focused on the dominant trends of um, uh, of, of women and people of color that will move the um, uh, the consumer products, you know, forward. The fact that you know we see in the, one of the most coveted spaces of all advertising, the English Premier League, the BLM sign on the jerseys of those in, in solidarity and support, uh, moving consumer bases and economic systems towards not only sustainability. Uh, but racial equity. So it's it's a fascinating time. I think there is reason for for hope, but those are some of the, you know, businesses made and and also of course the law is made to look analytically at things. But I find that so many times when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion or bias, we become we we sort of forget our own training. It's it, it's not a hard math problem to see that uh, you know this would be uh, optimal world would have the most talented people, which could shift almost $35 trillion if we were looking at um, top performing funds and enabling opportunities for women and people of color to be seen in the asset management business and that sort of back of the napkin. Um, but those, those skills that create that analysis are the same skills that create marketing strategies, distribution strategies, and most other strategies within uh, business models. So that's just a, a little context um, around, you know, the very tools that we learn within these systems are the same tools that can be used to optimize them and, and sort of, you know, uh, create a more, more optimal asset management business. Okay, so how do we, um, you, you mentioned the, the recent corporate commitments that resulted in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing. Uh, I think McKinsey calculated the aggregate amount of such corporate commitments to be in the neighborhood of $65 billion uh, across all different types of institutions. Uh, these are pledges from, from companies in various industries, large and small. So, you know, one question is how do we maximize or leverage those commitments for, for the maximum social impact. How, how optimistic are you that the, those will 
those commitments will actually change something long term versus merely give corporations some some good PR and, and marketing material in the short term. Yeah, I, I think that it's. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm not a golfer, but bear with me on this. But if I, if it, if if the first hole goes well, um, there's still a, 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 you know nine more, or eighteen more <laughs> to go well, and uh, I think that um, that's too little, too late, frankly, um, and the 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 real work is still to be done. Um, when we look at the actual numbers of the seven trillion dollars in cash on on balance sheets, you know, there's a, a long way to to go or more, uh, and particularly in in this season of the the, the highest market in history. Uh, you know, so it's a. I think there's a a real need. I mean, it's it's great that something's happened uh, again, right? You know, and this is because it's a cycle. What we look at to figure out sustainability and business models is how that fits into the business model going forward. Mm -hmm. It's not what happened today. Um, we're trying to, uh, in, in, in investment, we have this you know, phrase that uh, past performance doesn't lead to uh, future performance. And, and, mm -hmm. and what we would do is we track rigorously year over year, um, not just the cash commitments, although that's really important and the increase in that year over year would be important. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'd also look at the purchasing of supply chains, the hiring of diversity within for say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, black led law firms. So we'd look at, um, you know, digging into the board of those firms that are making these commitments and whether or not they're uh, showing up with, uh, you know, their first one black member board member in history and whether or not that continues um, you know, to, to women and, and other people of color reaching 50% parity where it probably should be anyway, based on the brilliance of, you know, the culture and, you know, the representation of people. So, I mean, this is not uh, a moment. This is a movement, you know, to use Hamilton's uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, a reference. I, I just think it's, it's, it's something that we have to uh, get accounting on um, both forensic and future looking. Because <laughs> when we look at, you know, I, I, for example, just give you a little sense of my life. Um, I'm often, you know, times pitching uh, university endowments that have sold slaves to um, pr protect the future of their school um, and the financial future of their school. So when I, when I look critically at, um, the institutions, um, you know, some who shut down multiple black medical schools at critical parts in history. And we look back to why there's so few black doctors and those organizations control massive amounts of assets. This is documented pretty well in the Flaxford report and other, other uh, types of reports. And these are funded often by philanthropy. And that doesn't mean philanthropy can't fund in the opposite ways. Um, to take away some of these challenges and, you know, foundations like the Ford Foundation have been doing incredible work to kind of re reverse this flow, but there's a long way to go. And my scoreboard, uh, we're, we're, we're nowhere close, right? 1%, 1.3% 1 of 69, we were playing basketball. Uh, you know, and the scoreboard was one to 69 trillion, we would know we're losing. <laughs> you know, it's a, so it's, it's laughable to me that we think uh, that even that amount of money from corporations in a massively undressed asset management business that owns those corporations, um, you know, without a, a, a sharp um, uh, kind of uh, analysis of why those dollars don't move. Um, that we're, we're kind of kidding ourselves as we look at the, the pennies on the table coming from corporations. Um, so that's, that's uh, I, I hope that was uh, clear or, or, or um, helpful within the analysis. It's not that leaders aren't, aren't trying to do good things, but we have to look at the right scoreboard. Right. Uh, that's very important to keep our keep our eye on the scoreboard and, and to know that at the at the least we're at the at the best we're at the very beginning of what needs to be an ongoing long term process. Uh, and we can't imagine that if corporations make some commitment now that they can then spend that money and it's over. Uh, we need to that's change. Right. Things and and like if every, I know the vaccine rollout has been tough, but, you know, if there's a commitment, you know, and people's lives are acting like their lives count on it. Yep. 
um, then then it then it gets done. So I I think that that kind of um, you know very intentional process of how do we get uh, to 50% of assets being managed by women in, or, or in people of color um, and the optimality within that is, that's the question. Um, and, and, and it, you know, I think that same group or similar groups of people can get together and figure that out. Um, it's just a, a, a magnitude different than what's been done. Okay, so let me go back to a, an issue from the very beginning, even before this call, before we started the call, we were talking about Hank Aaron. Oh, yeah. um, we, we've lost, I, I feel as though we've lost a lot of people in the last many months. Maybe this is, uh, those feelings are more acute uh, because we're in a time of COVID when it's difficult for people to actually come together and, and grieve people who are lost. Uh, but one of the people we've lost frequently is someone who I think you and I both uh, idolized, uh, which was a home run king. Uh, Hank Aaron. Uh, thoughts on Hank? Yeah, I just, uh, I was reading through um, some of the uh, quotes that he had given. And um, I just, you know, it's, it's such a powerful, uh, this is one too bad integration didn't come sooner because there were so many ball players that could have made it to the major leagues. That's why you look back and not to take away anything from Babe Ruth or some of the other guys, they just didn't play against the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, what baseball was kind of kidding itself that um, it was allowing the best players in when it was all uh, white male dominated mm -hmm. um, or all white male. I mean, it wasn't even dominated, it was just all white male. And when it began to, uh, you know, uh, desegregate, um, the outperformance of, um, you know, black players, um, you know, was really powerful um, and, and Cuban players more recently, uh, you know, across the world. But Hank Aaron sort of uh, reflecting on that, um, not just, yeah, I was, I was good and I was one of the best in the world. Um, and whether you're talking about pennants or World Series or, or hits, um, he, he, he had a lot of really humble quotes that we're talking about. Um, the fans love the home runs, but I, a triple was like, you know, my favorite of, you know, in, in sort of getting on, on base and being part of the team, but raising the entire team's play. And the, the idea that the same echoes of what was said about Hank Aaron are happening within asset management um, I just, you know, they just didn't go to the right schools in order to play baseball. Their, their scene is too slow to hit the baseball uh, without the proper training, you know, and, and these different things that came up in our research study were the, the types of language that was used was so similar. Mm -hmm. And once being given a shot, then he talked a lot about, you know, now that I, I, I proved it on the field, now I got to go walk to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. Right. So and that's an economic system that's preventing, you know, his brilliance in other areas potentially from being limited. So I just, you know, it's a, just a reflection, 87 years old and, you know, the home run king and, uh, you know, just uh, proving in a different area, breaking the imaginations and biases mm -hmm. that were put before him as Jackie Robinson did before him. And he is very uh, generous with his tributes to other players that never got a chance to show it. That's a great observation that, that the, the challenge of Hank Aaron is a challenge that we confront as well, which is to try to make visible the value that is unseen to so many. Um, and that, you know, makes our society a, a less rich, less full, less equitable place. So um, thank you for joining us today. I deeply appreciate this. It's been a wonderful conversation. These are important issues. Uh, which will be, you know, which, which highlight big ongoing challenges uh, that I hope lots of us can find ways to engage with. Uh, we're at our end time though. Uh, we will reconvene, but thank you for joining us today. Uh, this Thanks is the end. Me. This is the end of this session's Tuesday Race Talk. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.